Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea Sayanek. Uh, I'm Data Engineer at Gusto, and I'm here with Coin, uh, Lead Data Engineer at Gusto, and we are going to talk about how we are building a real-time supply chain view at Gusto. And this involves how we deal with a large amount of data to perform merge uh, and upsurge into our Delta Lake uh, to track ingredients through our supply chain and uh, get uh, benefits for the business uh, with this. So just to tell you a bit about Gusto, Gusto are the leading recipe box subscription company in the UK. Um, we have about 50 new recipes per week. So the way it works is you go in, you pick the recipes you want, um, you get a box every week as part of the subscription. Um, we describe ourselves as a data company that loves food. So everything we do has data at the heart of it. We drive all our decisioning through data. Um, and you know, it's, it's a key part of our business. Um, the box gives you everything you need for the recipe. So all the ingredients are pre kind of uh, prepared, pre-sorted, and, and you just get to focus on the cooking. To make this happen, we uh, have a fulfillment center uh, where you know, the boxes are literally, you know, the ingredients are picked and put into each box. Um, and that is you know, a, a key part of our business. If that works well, that ensures we are you know, operating well and enabling our customers to have a great product. Um, we are looking to move to a multi-site model. So because of that, our supply chain that, that drives the creation of these boxes, uh, so that means opening new factories, and um, because of that, the supply chain is super critical to our to our to our, our company. Um, so we've had a recent initiative internally to uh, improve the performance of our supply chain uh, by creating a whole set of key KPIs um, that help us look at our operational performance and and how our supply chain is processing. So, what does that mean? Well, our supply chain metrics, some of the idea, uh, some of the metrics behind this. Uh, we're focusing in online throughput. How many, literally, how many boxes are we processing through our factory per hour, per 15 minutes? We can identify bottlenecks through that. Also, we look at our picking stations. So do we have the right ingredients available there at the picking station to put in the shelf, uh, to put into the box from the shelf? Um, are they performing efficiently? Is there some process or um, performance issue happening there that we need to uh, try to address? Um, Obviously, we need to be able to order and understand what we need to order for, for, uh, for our boxes in the coming weeks and months. So we need to do forecasting. Our forecast accuracy is key, and the data from these systems drive that. And lastly, or well, one of the last areas uh, is uh, our actual stock performance. So that is the kind of upstream of our picking stations. How does stock get into our factory? How is it um, move through our factory and then how is it doing to get into the into the boxes and the tasks we need to create to drive that. This, um, this talk will mainly be focusing on the stock performance piece. Um, and you know that's been a, a it's a key te technical challenge for us. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about in this. So what does it mean? What is what does stock performance actually mean? So as you can imagine, uh, our ingredients arrive on a, on a lorry uh, in a bunch of pallets. Um, those pallets are received, they're quality checked, uh, they're checked for uh, food safety, they're then either stored or staged or both, you know, stored then staged, they're broken down even further from, you know, they go pallets, they're stored as boxes, they're broken down even further to individual ingredients, and then those individual ingredients are going into the box. So that generates uh, a lot of events for our, uh, for our system to try and track. As you can see, each time we break something down from one to many, we do all the various quality control checks, um, we do uh, we do a box goes from you know one box to n ingredients a packet of green beans or individual you know packets of chicken breasts or whatever that means so it generates a huge amount of data for us to keep track of um, so we had a technical um, problem to solve we had a, we had a requirement from our business to to help us help help them track this data and the key requirement we had was to generate a real time dashboard uh, from this data with K KPIs on it that dashboard had to have a 15 or less than 15 minute lag. So pretty close to real time uh, reporting. We had to capture all of the uh, ingredient events through that, that line that I just described. Um, and that equates to more than 8 million events a day. So not that big in big data terms, but quite big to do in, you know, in that 15 minute time window. And the key thing, we're still a startup. We worry about our costs. So this thing needed to be cost effective to run. So thinking about the solutions behind that, um, 
we, we knew we needed to build a real-time change data capture pipeline. Um, we have Redshift in the business, we have DBT, uh, so we're very familiar with, with RDBMS systems and SQL, and in the kind of old world, you would you know, do these kind of upsets and um, change data capture type processes in that. Um, but really they proved to, you know, they are very expensive, very easy to code, very easy to write the SQL behind it, but expensive at scale. And also for that real-time use case, realistically too slow. Um, in previous roles or, you know, a couple of years ago, you might've looked at using uh, Spark and Parquet, but as we'll kind of describe later on in this talk, doing a change data capture pipeline in Spark streaming um, without some other kind of, you know, technologies in the loop is pretty tricky. Um, so what we really zeroed in on is would Delta, uh, Delta Lake help us uh, work for this use case? Okay, so I'm going to describe to you uh, how our current uh, data pipeline works and what we built already with uh, Databricks. So we have data being ingested from different sources. Uh, you can take employee management where we control shifts and like uh, employees linked to stations and uh, yeah, everyone working at the factory. Uh, we have also data uh, that describes how boxes are moving through the lines and like each stations they are going in, uh, which items are being inserted into those boxes. So all this data is already being ingested with different methods, uh, Lambda functions, uh, DMS, uh, but we have uh, like different approaches for this and they are ingested into our uh, S3 bucket, uh, raw layer in S3. And uh, uh, those files are either uh, CSV, Parquet, JSON, it doesn't really matter. It's just the raw layer. Uh, and then uh, we have a Databricks uh, job running in a Databricks cluster uh, that loads this data and transforms it into a Delta uh, table in the cooked layer. So you might find a little bit funny the naming here, but we are a uh, company that works with food. So our data leaks, they are called raw, cooked, and served. Uh, so it's kind of different from the conventional approach. Uh, but yeah, the idea is the same. So uh, this data is ingested uh, from raw to cooked using autoloader. So what happens is when a new file arrives into a raw bucket, uh, it sends a notification to autoloader or uh, actually autoloader does all this work for us. It does the wiring between SMS, SQS, and bucket notification. So it receives this notification and it sends to uh, our streaming uh, in Spark telling, hey, there is a new file here to be processed. And then we process this file, we apply the transformations we need, and we save this as Delta in the group layer. And here, this process is a pen only. So if you think about this job in terms of coding, it's quite simple. Is read from stream, uh, apply some transformations, and save. And that's it. We don't need anything else. And it works as a charm. It works really well. Um, and this data is uh, glue catalog is in the middle, of course, to kind of uh, give all the schemas and uh, support uh, these tables in, uh, um, to, to, to serve from these tables. Uh, and then uh, the last bit is we serve this data to analysts, data scientists using Redshift Spectrum. So recently, uh, uh, AWS released a new integration between Redshift and Delta Lake. So this is much easier to do now. Uh, but anyway, we are doing this using Spectrum. So then we have uh, DBT running SQL in Redshift. So we get all this raw data that is stored in cook layer in Delta tables. We apply the business logic. We apply all the transformation we need. And we have a model layer. And this layer is actually what is exposed to the uh, business users. And this is where we get all the value. So here we do all the joins. We do all the filters we need. And we expose this. So our greatest challenge here is, OK, how do we move from this append only architecture to a streaming uh, and to do streaming in change data capture? So now we are not just receiving new events. We are also receiving updates, inserts, and deletes. So how, how do we apply this? And uh, this is what I want to discuss with you and like the drawbacks we had along the way and the solutions we found. Uh, so if you think about this before Delta, and uh, this was really uh, painful to do. 
So we basically had to load the target table in memory. We had to load the change data we are receiving also in, in memory, do the merge between the two tables, and then overwrite the target table. So this means there's a lot of overhead in uh, processing power, and it's very uh, slow. We need a lot of memory, and we need a lot of time doing uh, I.O. between files and saving uh, files back, because we're saving the, the whole table. So this approach, it works for uh, small files, but it doesn't work at scale. Uh, then if you go to Delta, uh, we have a similar approach, but much easier in terms of coding. Uh, we receive uh, change data, uh, we apply delta merge, and we uh, write it to delta table. So this was our first attempt uh, to do uh, CDC uh, in Spark streaming, and it works. Uh, however, when we tried to merge uh, millions of rows, this was really, really slow. It was impractical. It, we couldn't go to production. And actually, we deployed this to production, uh, and we had to roll back because it was really slow. We increased the, the cluster size, but it, it didn't really help too much. So we uh, rolled back, and we went back to the drawing board to understand how we could improve this. And Going back to the drawing board, we also went back to the documentation to see what else we could do to improve this. Uh, and we found about uh, doing partition pruning uh, when doing merge. So the idea here is that we want to mi minimize the scan on the target uh, delta table. So it doesn't, uh, we don't have to scan the whole table every time we are doing a merge or like an update. Uh, so the, the real challenge here was to find the right partitions for each table we are creating because we have to think about partitions in a way that they minimize the scan uh, and we don't uh, scan the whole table every time we have new events coming. So uh, then the, the approach is, after that, the approach is basically the same. Uh, we use Delta API to uh, perform a merge, but here the difference is that we do a merge on the partition keys. This means uh, we receive uh, the change data with, uh, that is kind of applying changes to just a few partitions. And then we just have to read and apply the changes to those same few partitions in the target table. And uh, the idea here is we don't, we don't have to rewrite the whole table. We just uh, overwrite the partition and we append to the partition. So. It works, uh, but it was still using a lot of compute resource when we compare to our current pipeline, uh, that one that was append only. So we still had to increase uh, our uh, cluster size. So it wasn't really good. We are concerned about the cost as well. So after that, uh, we started investigating a little more how we could improve. And the solution was actually quite simple. Uh, the only thing we had to do was to upgrade uh, Databricks to runtime seven, and with this we got Spark three. And the main benefits here were uh, the partition pruning, uh, the dynamic partition pruning that we got with Spark three, and also a lot of improvements in Delta Cache. So those two things combined, uh, they uh, helped us to deliver this data uh, in real time with much less uh, overhead in terms of resources. So here's our new architecture. And uh, if you see, this is quite similar to the previous one that I showed you. The big difference here is that now we have warehouse management uh, data being ingested. And this data is not append only. This is merge. This is CDC data, change data capture. So here we are doing updates, inserts, and deletes. And uh, the cool stuff here is that our architecture is exactly the same uh, by using Databricks, Autoloader, and uh, Spark Streaming we could uh, use the same architecture, the same technologies, and just extend the functionality to add uh, CDC and add merge. So this, this was really nice, and it was uh, really good for the, the engineering team, the data engineering team that didn't have to write a new process or refactor code. Uh, it was really simple and really uh, straightforward uh, to implement this. And also, like, no CI CD changes, not anything we could use uh, as it was. So this was a, a really huge win for us as well.
So what are the key benefits of, of enabling this? Well, I mean, the main thing or a big thing is this is hugely resource and cost effective. Um, if you think about, you know, uh, in previous roles, having to implement streaming jobs at this scale, uh, we would you would have had a fairly you know meaty cluster trying to run it. Um, right now, we have 18 of these streaming jobs on a single cluster, uh, a very small cluster of two to four um, of the smallest Delta cache enabled nodes in AWS, the i3 X larges. Um, and you can see, you know, it scales up and down only when needs, which is a, another amazing benefit of uh, of working with Databricks. And, and in that sidebar, you know, you can see we only really ever need the three nodes, uh, very rarely if we had to go up to four. Um, the other real benefit for us as engineers, I mean, this it's fast, so it meets our it meets our other requirement of of getting the data through within 15 minutes. Um, it gets it through much faster than it gives us plenty of time to run our DBT modeling to make sure our metrics are performing well on those dashboards. So, you know, this happens in, in a matter of minutes, uh, which uh, it then gives us that 15 minute or 10 minute window to get that data properly modeled in, in, in Redshift. Um, it's very few lines of code um, compared to similar systems I've worked on before. So we, we like that, it's very maintainable. Uh, a single, you know, merge statement is, is kind of the, the bulk of it. Um, so, uh, you know, really easy to support, really for, easy for us to run. And, and lastly, um, it's, it's really stable. We've deployed this, it's been running for hundreds of hours already, and we, we barely needed to, to touch it. it. It's, you know, you can see on that, that batch throughput uh, graph there, it just stays flat and, and uh, runs itself. So uh, really nice for our, for our engineering team, really low support. And obviously we, we met the, the business requirement. The other thing, though, the, the bigger thing, the real business benefit to Gusto is this has kind of been the missing piece in our kind of KPIs around our supply chain data. So, you know, joining that with the line throughput, with the picking performance and forecasting, and now having that real insight into our stock system and even down to an individual ingredient, how that moves through the line, um, gives us amazing insight into our into our supply chain, which means better fulfillment and a better customer experience. Um, it also really sets us up well for the future. We're opening new factories, very exciting, great to be part of a company that's growing. And every solution we're building now, we want to keep that in mind. So this, this thing, we know we can scale it. We know it will scale. We're using so little resource now. We know it will scale fairly linearly. Um, and that's, uh, that's really going to set us up well for the future. Um, and that's it. That's all we want to talk about. Thank you very much.